of Directors, I'd like to welcome you all to the second, actually the third of three presentations on Ruskin and the American Transcendentalists. Um, we're focusing on John Muir tonight. These lectures are a part of an effort we undertake from time to time to highlight the influence of British art and social critic John Ruskin on America, an influence that created, among other things, many movements and associations, the Ruskin Art Club in Los Angeles some 133 years ago. And tonight I'm delighted to welcome Ruskin Art Club Executive Director, Gabriel Meyer. He's going to be reflecting on Ruskin and John Muir. I had the pleasure to hear Gabriel lecture on Ruskin in California at the Ruskin Bicentenary Conference at the Huntington Library in December of 2019, which proved to be the last in-person conference that I attended before the world shut down because of COVID. So I'm excited to get to hear Gabriel again tonight. Wish it was in person, um, but I'm glad that we're all gathered here. Uh, as you may know, Gabriel is an award-winning novelist, poet, and journalist. He's traveled widely in the Middle East, covering the first Palestinian intifada in 1989 and reporting from Egypt and Turkey on the plight of non-Muslim and religious communities in the region. Gabriel also covered the Balkans, reporting on the Bosnian War, and his reporter's diary from Sarajevo was nominated for several awards. His travels to Sudan resulted in a feature length documentary called The Hidden Gift. He's lectured widely in the United States and Europe, including major addresses at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, at Notre Dame University Law School and the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, to name just a few. His most recent project is a cultural history of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre entitled The Testimony of Stones, a biography of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre Jerusalem, which is awaiting publication. And of course, Gabriel has also written and lectured extensively on the thought of British art and social critic John Ruskin. And since 1998, he, and he has been president and now executive director of the Ruskin Art Club. In the early years of this century, Meyer led the Venerable Association back to its roots in Ruskin and toward a new future, not as a private club, but as a public arts corporation dedicated to applying Ruskin's insights to the challenges of our time. Um, so I wanna welcome Gabriel and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. My talk tonight, Mountain Gloom and Mountain Glory, Ruskin and John Muir. Poetry makes nothing happen, W.H. Auden famously quipped in the 1930s. One knows what he meant. Poetry was being pulled in all directions by 30s ideologues hoping to enlist poetry in their causes and the great British American poet wished to disabuse them. But at the outset of my talk, I'm gonna take issue with Mr. Auden. Poetry does make some things happen. For example, Denise Levertov in her 1992 poem, The Faithful Lover, brings together two men who, though they had a lot in common, never met, John Ruskin and John Muir, and who never could have been together where the poet imagined them, namely in Yosemite. Not only that, but she manages to bring together two mountain ranges on two different continents, the California Sierras and the Swiss Alps, all through the miracle of the poetic imagination. My friend Ann Pitek brought Levertov's poem to my attention some months ago, a poem which not only pictures John Ruskin in Yosemite, but which interweaves lines from Ruskin's autobiography, Praeterita, into the mix. These are in italics. Uh, I'm going to bring up the poem in just a moment. So the, the lines of the poem that are in italics uh, are uh, Ruskin's lines from Praeterita. I thought it appropriate to start our reflection on Ruskin in Muir and mountains with this most eventful fiction. Play with a few decades, shift them, Try to imagine Ruskin in the new world, walking with John Muir in the wilderness. He whose enraptured first sight of the Alps transformed him that meek Protestant Sunday when he and Mama and Papa and dull cousin Mary were patiently waiting the secular week's beginning before attempting the sights 
all unawares came face to face with the sublime. Unmistakably not clouds, surpassing all that engravings had promised, floating west of Schaffhausen, sharp, tinged with rose, far into blue, suddenly beyond. Changed him from docile prig, poor child. He was 14 and knew so much and so little. To a man of passion, whatever his failings. Imagine him in Yosemite. Would loyalties already divided, rock simple or rock rot, strata of mountain, strata of human craft, tools of geology or tools of art have split him? Would wilderness, legends unknown, or if known, offering no toehold for his mind's expectant footing, have swept him wholly into its torrents of non-human grandeur? Or wouldn't art have pulled him back in the end to layered history felt in the bones? Even geology, a fraction of that insistence, loved for its poetry of form, color, textures, not as a scientist loves it. Back to where human hands created rich tessellations or the shadowy Rialto through its colossal curve slowly forth. That strange curve so delicate, so adamantine, strong as a mountain cavern, graceful as a bow just bent. Back to where nature, even the Alps still so remote, unsung through so many centuries, lay in the net or nest of perception, seen then reseen, recognized, wrought in myth. In a mountain cabin in 1872 in Yosemite, naturalist John Muir set himself to read Ruskin. This was not the first, nor would it be the last time that Muir immersed himself in Ruskin's works. A year earlier, 1871, he indicated that he was reading Ruskin in a, le in a letter to Jane Carr, a friend from his university years in Madison, Wisconsin, who had introduced him to the works of Emerson Thoreau. And in 1873, he thanked J.B. McChesney, superintendent of schools in Oakland, California, for gifts of Ruskin's books. That this was not casual reading as indicated in the end notes and marginalia that Muir penciled in his copies of Ruskin volumes, notes that are intended not only to record first impressions, but to facilitate further study. Muir would acquire a total of 12 Ruskin volumes over the years, volumes frequently marked with an abbreviated Y-O for Yosemite. As Terry Gifford notes in his essay on Muir's Ruskin, quote, Muir is using his reading of Ruskin to inform his thinking about Yosemite. It was not a reciprocal relationship. Ruskin did not read the works of many Americans. He did read and follow Emerson's career but he does not appear to have known about or read Thoreau, for example, or for that matter, Muir. As for the Americans who did read Ruskin from the American pre-Raphaelites in the 1850s to the social reformers at the end of the century, they tended to read selectively, a decidedly pick and mix approach. Often they knew only a few works, usually the earlier volumes of modern painters or the elements of drawing or later sesame and lilies and for labor activists unto this last. Few read seriously enough to follow Ruskin's complex and many-sided trajectory from art criticism to social reform and ecological concern. Most were content to take what they liked from Ruskin and ignore, if not disavow, the rest. What is interesting about three, the three American thinkers, Emerson, Thoreau, and Muir, that we have been considering is that they had read Ruskin, both more seriously and more systematically. And common to all three, they all in different ways and to different degrees wrestled 
with that influence. In the early 1870s, when John Muir was reading Ruskin at midnight beneath Upper Yosemite Falls, was a particularly ap active time in Ruskin's involvement with America, a country he never visited despite the urgings of his close friend and correspondent Charles Eliot Norton, or for the, that matter, cared to visit. As Ruskin wrote in Fort Clavigera, his letters to the working men of England, Sarah quoted this famous quip in her talk at the beginning of this series, quote, though I have kind invitations to visit America, I could not even for a couple of months live in a country so miserable as to possess no castles. As Sarah noted, uh, we, we do have to hear this very peculiar, it's not simply a snooty comment. There is a, a particular Ruskinian humor in remarks like this. Castles or no castles, Ruskin was an international celebrity in those years and a strong focus of transatlantic interest. Among other involvements, Ruskin saw to the sale of his prize Turner painting, popularly known as the slave ship, but originally entitled Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon, coming on 1840, to the American collector J.T. Johnston, founder and president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in 1872, then an infant museum. It eventually ended up in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where you can see it today. A sign that the Cognoscenti of New York knew some Ruskin is evidenced by the excitement with which the purchase was greeted at the outset. There were few other Turners in America at the time, and the fame of Turner's slave ship rested almost entirely on Ruskin's vivid description of the painting in Modern Painters One, of water as painted by Turner, one of the most celebrated passages in all Ruskin. The youthful exuberance of which Ruskin later said he regretted. Temperate writing, he noted in 1847, will I am afraid be too soon in me compulsory. Well, not too soon compulsory. When the painting was exhibited in New York to great public excitement, quote, the inflated expectations created by Ruskin's text, as Robert Hewison notes, resulted in widespread outrage at the perceived discrepancies between his words and the image in reality. As a consequence, the reputation of the artist was sullied while that of the critic was discredited." End quote. In Boston at a later exhibition in 1877, the correspondence between text and painting were considered so close that copies of Ruskin's text were printed and made available to viewers on chairs drawn up around the painting shown in isolation in the Great Hall. The subject matter of visceral, indeed, unforgettable treatment of the evils of the slave trade. Coming only seven years after the close of the Civil War and the onset of Reconstruction, I suggest, may have also had to do, may have also had to do with aspects of the public's discomfort. Even Ruskin admitted that the painting was difficult to live with. A year later, as Sarah highlighted in her talk two weeks ago, Ruskin and Emerson, both public figures and national sages of sorts, who had admired each other to varying degrees over the years and had certainly read each other, met and, quote, collided at Oxford. Both men, the American prophet of self-reliance and Ruskin, the critic of industrial modernity, found themselves profoundly out of sympathy with each other's views of the world. During the same period, the 1870s, during years when Ruskin was founding the Guild of St. George to translate his ideas into practical programs of action, the British American working class activist, William Harrison Riley, a member of the Guild and a frequent long-term visitor to the US, he moved permanently to America in the 1880s, tried to create a working relationship between his two heroes, Walt Whitman and John Ruskin. Mark Frost has written a fascinating portrait of Riley 
and his ill-fated campaign to link Ruskin with the American poet and raise Whitman's profile and earning potential in Britain. The effort, of course, foundered, not on prospects for social reform and opposition to the avarice of the Gilded Age, which they shared, but on Whitman's mistrust of aestheticism and his belief in the providential role of America in forging a new kingdom of God. A project that in post-Civil War America was increasingly located in the country's move westward under big skies and an imagined untamed wilderness. As Thoreau, include, as Thoreau enthused in 1862, quote, if the heavens of America appear infinitely higher and the stars brighter, I trust these facts are symbolical of the height to which the philosophy and poetry and religion of her inhabitants may one day soar. Will not man grow to greater perfection intellectually as well as physically under these circumstances? I trust that we shall be more imaginative, that our thoughts will be clearer, fresher, and more ethereal as our sky, our understanding more comprehensive and broader like our planes, our intellect generally on a grander scale like our thunder and lightning, our rivers and mountains and forests, and our hearts shall even correspond in breadth and depth and grandeur to our inland seas." End quote. And of course, Whitman. A promised California, also to the great pastoral plains and for Oregon. Sojourning east a while longer soon, I travel toward you to remain to teach robust American love. For I know very well that I and robust love belong among you inland and along the Western sea. For these states tend inland and toward the Western sea. And I will also. As we see with Muir's example, Ruskin, whose first American friends and disciples attended to congregate around the hubs of New York and Boston, went west too. The writer Mary Austin, who came to California in 1888, for example, records in her autobiography that her father made sure that the family was well supplied with first editions of Ruskin's works as they were published. Austin's father, like so many other 19th century transplants, had been a captain in the Civil War and Mary who settled eventually in Owens Valley, just east of the Sierras in the town of Independence, became a noted local writer, a chronicler of the infamous water wars that were to overtake the area at the turn of the century and a student of the Native American cultures of the Mojave Desert. It's perhaps not unworthy of mention in this context that 1888 is the year the Ruskin Art Club was founded by Mary Boyce, wife of another Civil War veteran in Los Angeles. Before we examine the effects of Muir's, the effects of Muir's solitary study of Ruskin, we should seek a little perspective about Muir himself and note, as we shall do throughout this talk, the many correspondences with Ruskin's life and interests. Muir was born in Scotland in 1838. Interestingly, of, of course, Ruskin's family had Scottish roots as well. Into an intensely religious family for whom the established Church of Scotland was deemed too liberal. Muir's stern father, a member of the dissenting secession church in Dunbar, Scotland, located on the North Sea coast, about 30 miles from Edinburgh, heard Thomas Campbell speak there in 1847 of a further breakaway group, the Disciples of Christ, who rejected the authority of any established church and were flourishing along the American frontier with their pioneering spirit of religious freedom and simplicity. By 1850, Daniel Muir had moved his family to Wisconsin. The elder Muir's notion of the good life for his children consisted of long hours of hard work during the day and studying Bible verses by night. Plutarch and Shakespeare were permitted in the house, but uh, not philosophers. 
Like Ruskin, Muir knew much of the Bible by heart, but it was the Wisconsin wilderness itself that Muir claimed as his teacher. As he was to write later, this sudden plash into pure wildness, baptism in nature's warm heart, how utterly happy it made us. Nature streaming into us, wooingly teaching her wonderful glowing lessons, so unlike the dismal grammar ashes and cinders so long thrashed into us. Here, without knowing it, we were still at school, every wild lesson not whipped, but charmed into us." End quote. After studying geology and botany at the University of Wisconsin in the early 1860s, Muir, as Terry Gifford notes, quote, declined to accept that the Civil War was his war and escaped conscription by botanizing and working as an inventor in Canada. In 1867, Muir embarked on his later famous a thousand mile walk to the Gulf to take passage to Cuba, following in the footsteps of his new intellectual hero, the German naturalist and explorer, Alexander von Humboldt, and then on to South America. Humboldt and his influential concept of, a nature, as, of nature as a web of interconnected organisms, as a natural whole animated and moved by inward forces dominated Muir's thinking at the time and had already begun to loosen the young explorer's ties to his religious upbringing and even to the anthropocentric worldviews of other transcendentalists such as Emerson and Thoreau. Quote, why ought man to value himself as more than an infinitely small unit of one great unit of creation, Muir wrote in his journals. The cosmos will be incomplete without man, but also without the small transmicroscopic creature, end quote. As Gifford notes, this was an important preparation for the later influence of John Ruskin and the reading of the glaciated mountains of California, where small signs revealed huge and historic forces at work in nature. Waylaid in his plans for the trek to South America by a fever, Muir was intrigued by an advertisement, probably from the Hutchins Hotel in Yosemite, describing a wondrous valley with steep canyon walls. He may also have consulted the geological reports then being issued by the state of California under Josiah D. Whitney, state geologist and professor of geology at Harvard University. As many of you know, Muir would, uh, and Whitney would later cross intellectual swords in one of the great scientific battles of the time over the origins of Yosemite. The Yosemite Valley that Muir first entered in 1869 was a fruit orchard and a pig farm leased out to the state of California. There he stayed for the next six years with many later sojourns, becoming the chronicler, tourist guide, and most importantly, the first systematic student and explorer of the backcountry of the Sierras and the mysteries of the formation of what he called the range of light. As Muir would record in his diary of June 6th, 1869, quote, we are now in the mountains and they are in us kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver, filling every pore and cell of us. Our flesh and bone tabernacle seems transparent as glass to the beauty about us, as if truly an inseparable part of it, thrilling with the air and trees, streams and rocks in the waves of the sun, a part of all nature, neither old nor young, sick nor well, but immortal. Muir, however, was about something more, more than mountain lyricism. As early as 1863, Josiah Dwight Whitney, after whom Mount Whitney is named, leader of the California Geological Survey, posited that the Yosemite Valley and the Sierras themselves originated in catastrophic seismic activity. Muir spent much of his early years in Yosemite seeking and with considerable success to disprove that thesis 
with evidence that the enormous excavating work of glaciers had sculpted the valleys of the Sierras. Dismissed at first by the experts, by 1871, Muir had discovered and documented eight glaciers in the canyons above Yosemite. Studies in the Sierras, which we shall mention later on, written while Muir was immersing himself in Ruskin, is sometimes referred to as the Bible of glaciation. Perhaps the highlight of those early years in the Sierras occurred in May 1871, when Muir's Wisconsin friends, the Cars, persuaded Ralph Waldo Emerson to seek out Muir in Yosemite. In spite of Muir's overtures, the elderly Emerson would not leave the comfort of his entourage to go camping with Muir in the rough. But they did have extensive discussions together during Emerson's stay, discussions that renewed Muir's interest in Emerson's natural philosophy and which, according to a fascinating recent study by Devin Zuber, a language of things, established connections over time between Muir and the San Francisco Swedenborgians, notably the California landscape painter, William Keith. Scholar Dennis Cosgrove, many decades ago now, called Ruskin's mindset a geographical imagination. Ruskin himself tells us in Modern Painters Volume 4 that love for landscape has, quote, been the ruling passion of my life and the reason for the choice of its field of labor, end quote. In The Eagle's Nest, published in 1872, Ruskin wrote these famous words. There is nothing that I tell you with more eager desire that you should believe nothing with wider ground in my experience for requiring you to believe than this, that you will never love art well till you love what she mirrors better. It is the widest, as clearest experience I have to give you. And, the, and for the beginning of all my own right artwork in life, and it may not be unprofitable that I tell you this, depended not on my love of art, but of mountains and sea. You will never love art well till you love what she mirrors better. This geographical imagination may be traced to three formative influences in Ruskin's life. I'm just going to sketch these very briefly. Interestingly, these same formative influences played with some differences, of course, a parallel role in Muir's development, which we shall note as we go along. First, Romanticism. Ruskin's early childhood introduction to Romantic writers, Walter Scott in particular, gave him an appetite and appreciation for the mountain landscapes that stayed with him his whole life. Wordsworth's 1814 poem, The Wanderer, part of the excursion, would be typical of the romantic approach to the Alpine world, mountains as scenes of revelation and communion. Oh, then what soul was his when on the tops of the high mountains, he beheld the sun rise up and bathe the world in light. He looked ocean and earth. The solid frame of earth and ocean's liquid mass beneath him lay in gladness and deep joy. The clouds were touched and in their silent faces did he read unutterable love. Sound needed none, nor any voice of joy. His spirit drank the spectacle. Sensation, soul and form all melted into him. They swallowed up his animal being in them did he live? And by then, did he live? Coupled with that, Ruskin's family was wealthy and could afford leisurely annual holiday sightseeing in Britain and Europe, often lasting months, which introduced the young Ruskin to the landscapes in England and Scotland, and later France, Germany, Northern Italy, and most formatively, Switzerland.
writing in his unfinished autobiography, Pray Terita, at the end of his writing life. Ruskin recalls his ecstasy at the first sight of the Alps. There was no thought for a moment of there being clouds. They were clear as crystal, sharp on the pure horizon sky, and already tinged with rose by the sinking sun. Infinitely beyond all that we had ever thought or dreamed, the seen walls of lost Eden could not have been more beautiful to us, not more awful round heaven, the walls of sacred death. It is not possible to imagine at any time of the world a more blessed entrance into life for a child of such a temperament as mine. For me, the Alps and their people were alike beautiful in their snow and their humanity, and I wanted neither for them nor for myself sight of any thrones in heaven but the rocks, or of any spirits in heaven but the clouds. Ruskin said that he found his mission, his destiny, in that childhood encounter with the Alps, and it must be said, his methodology. Mountains are the beginning and end of all natural scenery, Ruskin wrote. As Ruskin indicates in Deucalion, 1875 to 1883, a relatively late work on geology, your power of seeing mountains cannot be developed either by your vanity, your curiosity, or your love of muscular exercise. It depends on the cultivation of the instrument of sight itself and of the soul that uses it. As soon as you can see mountains rightly, you will also see hills and valleys with considerable interest. And it works the other way too. For a stone, Ruskin says, when it is examined, will be found a mountain in miniature. We would have to add to the influence of the romantic poets the concept of the sublime as articulated by Edmund Burke in his famous work of 1757, a philosophical inquiry in the origins of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful. Burke calls sublime experiences, calls sublime experiences in which we feel that we have lost control which we cannot measure or analyze, in which our knowledge confronts its limits, something like the negative capability of Keats. Burke lists as manifestations of the sublime, experiences of terror, privation, infinity, vastness, obscurity. All these rob the mind of its capacity to rationally encompass the experience, awesome in the old meaning of the term. In Burke's notion of the sublime, the experience controls us, undermines our sense of power, and even threatens our sense of self-preservation. Ruskin, who had explored, studied, and drawn mountainscapes all his life, had had many sublime experiences. They appear as early as his descriptions of mountain streams in his children's story, The King of the Golden River written in his early 20s in 1841. The story concerns three brothers in a mountain valley, two of whom fail the test of charity and fall victim to turbulent alpine cataracts. This tells the fate of the second brother, Schwartz. And the bank of black cloud rose to the zenith, and out of it came bursts of spiry lightning, and waves of darkness seemed to heave and float between their flashes over the whole heavens. And when Schwartz stood by the brink of the Golden River, its waves were black like thunder clouds, but their foam was like fire, and the roar of the waters below and the thunder above met as he cast the flask into the stream. And as he did so, the lightning glared into his eyes, and the earth gave way beneath him, and the waters closed over his cry, and the moaning of the river rose wildly in the night as it gushed over the two 
black stones. Muir had similar, if less gloomy, mountain epiphanies in California. In a famous journal entry on his first sight of the Sierras, to lovers of the wild, these mountains are not a hundred miles away. Their spiritual power and the goodness of the sky makes them near as a circle of friends. You cannot feel yourself out of doors. Plain, sky and mountains, ray beauty which you feel. You bathe in these spirit beams, turning around and around as if warming at a campfire. Presently, you lose consciousness of your own separate existence. You blend with the landscape and become part and parcel of nature. The second influence on Ruskin's geographical imagination was drawing, and through it, the development of an early eye for accurate observation. As Cosgrove notes, the sources of Ruskin's inspiration were never purely aesthetic, but were linked to a scientific study of form. In his youth, Ruskin intensively studied alpine geology and joined a number of geological societies and published a paper on denudation in the Alps in 1865. In fact, geology and mineralogy were his first loves before art. This is, by the way, a photo to the left, a daguerreotype, which Ruskin and his valet, Frederick Crawley, took in 1854 of the Mer de Glace at Chamonix. This is a photo to the right in 2018 of the same valley. In the end, however, Ruskin rejected a purely scientific approach in favor of what he calls in modern painters quote, a science of the aspects of things, end quote, a science that included the perception and love of beauty. In order to understand the character, the essence of landscapes, one could not stop at the mere examination of mountain anatomies, but in the direction of what we might call precision seeing. Ruskin writes in an appendix to Modern Painters 4 about the limitations of the scientific method. And I was confirmed in this feeling by De Saussure, uh, an 18th century Swiss geologist and alpinist whose grandson was Ferdinand de, de Saussure, the famous uh, linguist and semiotician. The only scientific writer whose help I could not refuse in the course of these inquiries. His I received for this reason. All other geological writers who, whose works I'd ex I had examined were engaged in the maintenance of some theory or other and always gathering material to support the theory. But I found Saussure had gone to the Alps as I desired to go myself, only to look at them and describe them as they were, loving them heartily, loving them the positive Alps more than himself, or that science, or than science, or than any theories of science. Therefore, he writes in Modern Painters, I closed the geological books and set myself as far as I could to see the Alps in a simple, thoughtless, and untheorizing manner, but to see them, if might be, thoroughly. This doesn't mean that Ruskin, in rejecting the purely empirical, abandoned the eye for accuracy or, and for the accurate record of what was seen. But Ruskin believed that in order to see clearly, one needed to divest oneself of a priori notions and theoretical frameworks in order to experience external phenomena directly, developing an understanding of landscape from a lived experience of it, seeing rather than observing, involving the radical engagement of the self with the land. We might note here the notion of love. It's a very important one in Ruskin. The seeing process is not complete until one loves what one has seen. That is to say, sees it in all its individuality, its indispensableness, and has realized that one has ethical duties toward it, that seeing involves responsibility. The third formative influence was his religious background, a, a background we should note 
which was remarkably similar in its stern biblical pedagogy to Muir's. Uh, Ruskin's religious background is a talk in itself, but let me underline this element in Rus Ruskin's religious formation. He grew up in a strict evangelical household, not untypical of the period. Church of England, of course, but low as against high church, focused on the reading and memorization of scripture and on preaching. His mother, Margaret Ruskin, enlisted him in a daily regimen of close reading of the Bible text, book by book. I say close reading because this involved not only names and dates and exotic ancient Middle Eastern locales, but as Robert Hewison points out in his study, John Ruskin, The Argument of the Eye, an intense familiarity with Christian typology. That is, the uncovering of Christological patterns in the texts of the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, thus highlighting the complex unity and continuity of scripture. For example, Jonah's confinement in the belly of the whale is seen to foreshadow Christ's burial and rising. The rock in the desert that Moses struck, miraculously producing water for the people, prefigures Christian baptism. Hewison's analysis would seem to limit such typological preoccupations to evangelicals, but a typological reading of scripture dates back at least to Philo and the first century Alexandrian Judaism and has been a part of Christianity from the very beginning. We find it in the New Testament, for example. This is very important in my view for understanding Ruskin's later method of interpreting landscapes. Typology at its core is the search for underlying connections, patterns, what in more secular terms might be called deep structure. Beneath the diversity of discrete phenomena are connections that suggest the presence of underlying unity and more important still, underlying meaning. Nature for Ruskin is a book into which one peers again and again for deepening levels, layers of truth, networks of correspondences. We see this also in Ruskin's approach to painting. He is one of the pioneers of the close reading of pictures. It's not enough merely to observe the painting and decide whether you like it or not. The very forms of the painting, the spatial arrangements of its details, its composition, suggest the deeper layers of aesthetic intention and meaning. So too in nature. The very shapes of the mountains contain moral and sociological implications. Ruskin somewhere uses a phrase, the politics of the mountains. For Ruskin, these are not merely matter for private reflection, but compelling moral indices, lessons requiring moral responses. Ruskin in Modern Painters 4, in a chapter on compact crystallines, writes, there is one lesson evidently intended to be, to be taught by the, by the different characters of these rocks, which we must not allow to escape us. These natural ordinances seem intended to teach us the great truths, which are the basis of all political science. How the polishing friction which separates, the affection which binds, and the affliction that fuses and confirms are accurately symbolized by the processes to which the several ranks of hills appear to owe their present aspect. Again, sometimes Ruskin's efforts to draw moral lessons out of the dynamic of natural processes can appear naive, in other instances, revelatory. But what we have to keep in mind is what he is attempting to see the dynamics of nature and the dynamics of human life as part of a single web of interactions, not discrete compartments of isolated phenomena, but a single integrated language of being. This, by the way, is a drawing of a, the curve of a glacier by which Ruskin is suggesting the, uh, that natural various kinds of natural forms and ornamentation uh, mirror this, this curvature. Which brings us to Muir's spirited response to his reading of Ruskin. 
as we said earlier, Muir read Ruskin in stages, and at least in the earlier stages, was content, according to the copies of Muir's Ruskin now in the collection of the University of the Pacific, to mark his copies in order to facilitate future reference, his annotations are straightforward, not critical. We mentioned previously that, that Y.O. is written alongside many passages indicating that Muir was using Ruskin as a basis for his own thinking about Yosemite. There are even positive annotations where Muir has highlighted Ruskinian passages such as, let architects go to the hills for study. And my favorite, in his copy of Modern Painters One, every Scotchman loves Heather a thousand years before he was born. Further, as Terry Gifford argues persuasively in his 2016 essay on Modern Painters Four and Muir's Studies in the Sierras, that Muir's 1874 book on glaciation was heavily influenced by the model provided in Ruskin's work, not only in Ruskin inflected prose, but even in the design and layout of Muir's chapters. This is a layout of modern painters with its mix of precise geological drawings. And this is the layout of the studies in the Sierras. We might demonstrate the strength of this influence by a comparison of passages in Ruskin and Muir. There are many to choose from, but for the sake of time, let's sample these. As Terry Gifford notes, they read almost as if written by one hand, such is their consistency of style and content. In the hand of the great architect of the mountains, time and decay are as much the instruments of his purpose as the forces by which he first led forth the troops of hills and leaping flux, the lightning and the torrent and the wasting and weariness of innumerable ages all bear their part in the working out of one consistent plan. This is Ruskin, Modern Painters 4. Muir, the master builder chose for a tool not the earthquake nor lightning to rend and split asunder, not the stormy torrent nor eroding rain, but the tender snow flowers, noiselessly falling through unnumbered seasons, the offspring of the sun and sea. The clear evidence of Ruskin's influence doesn't prevent Muir, however, from a spirited American critique of the eminent European master's ideas in his letters, very much along the lines of Thoreau's uh, critical dialogue with Ruskin that Professor Walls outlined for us last week. Muir develops his most extended references to Ruskin in a letter to McChesney, uh, in 1873, the Oakland friend who had loaned him copies of Ruskin's works. This is actually the letter itself. I have just finished a ramble through the handsome gardens of Ruskin that you gave me. Page after page is studded with flowers like a glacier meadow and most of his chapters of hill and dale make a handsome landscape in spite of his numberless boundaries and human carved rocks. Few of our modern writers are so strikingly suggestive as Ruskin. His pungent steel tempered sentences compel one to think and his errors and absurdities are so clearly expressed that they do good rather than harm. A particularly vivid form of the backhanded compliment. Since what can only be called Muir's rant goes on paragraph after paragraph like this. One wonders whether McChesney thought twice about loaning Muir books again. Among the things that provoked Muir about Ruskin is what he, and not, and not he alone among Americans, perceives as Ruskin's focus on the shadow side of nature. What Ruskin in Modern Painters 4 calls mountain gloom in contrast to mountain glory. As Muir wrote to a friend, how cordially I disbelieve Ruskin tonight. 
And were he to dwell a while among the powers of these mountains, he would forget all dictionary differences between the clean and the unclean, and he would lose all memory and meaning of the diabolical and sin begotten term foulness. Of course, the problem was, as Muir well knew, Ruskin had dwelt among the powers of the mountains, and what is more, had long been an unparalleled student of mountain life and terrain, as well as mountain geology. For all Ruskin's celebration of the natural world and its divinely appointed beauty, as we have already noted, Ruskin warned against a sentimental bucolic view of nature. The nature Ruskin chronicled was a wounded nature in which death, cruelty, and dysfunction were tragic and essential features. In Ruskin, nature is decidedly not perfect. In a classic passage, he writes, in the utmost solitudes of nature, the existence of hell seems to me as legibly declared by a thousand spiritual utterances as that of heaven. It is well for us to dwell with thankfulness on the unfolding of the flower and the falling of the dew and the sleep of the green fields and the sunshine. But the blasted trunk, the barren rock, the moaning of the bleak winds, the roar of the black perilous, merciless whirlpools of the mountain streams, the solemn solitudes of moors and seas, the continual fading of all beauty into darkness and of all strength into dust, have these no language for us? We may seek to escape their teaching by reasoning touching the good which is wrought out of all evil, but it is vain sophistry. The good succeeds to the evil as day succeeds the night, but also the evil to the good. This is from the Stones of Venice. Ruskin means many things by his gloom. Among them, the perspectives of ancient writers and the conventions of landscape art that viewed mountains as negative spaces, scenes of struggle and peril, zones inhospitable to human life as barriers. As Ruskin says, Dante did not like mountains. On this, by the way, I recommend the classic 1959 study by Margaret Hope Nicholson, Mountain Gloom and Mountain Glory, the Development of the Aesthetics of the Infinite. Ruskin's gloom also refers to the natural processes that are, that are destructive, out of order, death dealing, fallen nature, or simply mysterious, numinous nature as other, nature as other. We also always have to remember that for, this is crucial, that for Ruskin, nature is not static order as it was for the 18th century. Nature is not order, something to be contemplated. Nature is energy something alive, and this he learned from Turner. And most importantly, nature as wounded and polluted by human activity, by human exploitation, by human abuse, a perception so compelling that the latter part of Ruskin's life was spent not in the study of art and nature, but in the study of human society and how it might be ordered to the common good and to the healing of the natural world. Muir will have none of it. The worst thing I find in Ruskin's books is his lack of faith in the scriptures of nature. Nature, according to Ruskin, is the joint work of God and the devil, and therefore made up of alternate strips and bars of evil and good. Evil, he says, always exists with good and ugliness with beauty in order to act as foils the one for the other. Beside every mountain angel, he sets a mountain devil, and the blackness of the one may be made wholly striking by the whiteness of the other, and that the angel's white may be brightened by the devil's black. Here I want to say so much that I cannot say anything. Taking him on directly, Muir quotes the passage from Stones of Venice that we've just considered, and then counters. And I know something about the blasted trunk and the barren rock, the moaning of the bleak winds, the solemn solitudes of moors and seas, the roar of the black perilous, merciless whirlpools of the mountain streams, 
and they have a language for me. But they declare nothing of the wrath or of hell, only love plain as was ever spoken. Christianity and mountainanity, it's a wonderful phrase in Muir. Christianity and mountainanity are streams from the same fountain. And when I read the boogies of Ruskin's mountain gloom and mountain evil and mountain devil and the unwholesomeness of mountain beauty as everyday breath and bread, then I wish for plenty of words at a preacher's commission. Now, as many commentators point out, Muir's is anything but a coherent critique of Ruskin. For one thing, it must be pointed out that Muir's comments about Ruskin occur informally in private correspondence. This is not a public published critique. Nevertheless, it is a misreading of Ruskin in the tenor of his thought. As Terry Gifford notes in his essay on Muir's Ruskin, Muir is not reading Ruskin at all but responding to trigger words in Ruskin that spark negative reactions and not incidentally serve to help him articulate his own thinking. We talked about this aspect in the discussion after last week's talk, Ruskin, the old world European sage against whom new world American thinkers must test their mettle. Gifford also notes that the strategic distancing Muir demonstrates in his letters, the straw man he often makes of Ruskin's ideas, may point to Harold Bloom's anxiety of influence, the need to disavow a mentor's impact. But there are issues in Muir's critique. To Muir's joyous born again vision of nature, mountain gloom is an oxymoron. For Muir, the focus was on unity. Everything in nature is whole. Balance and harmony were his key words. Even destruction is only a stage in the creation of a greater, greater harmony. <coughs> Excuse me. Quote, out of all the cold darkness and glacial grinding comes this warm abounding beauty and life to teach us that what we in our faithless ignorance call destruction is creation finer and finer. What he thought he saw in Ruskin was dualism, a nature of contrasting, if not contending forces. But Ruskin uses such language, the language of dualism, to highlight the tragic aspects of nature, and more importantly, the imperative of human choices and the consequences of those choices on the fabric of creation. What Ruskin was doing in invoking God and the devil was not in Ruskin's words to point to an evil inherent in the hills themselves, but on the dilemma of human presence, influence, and responsibility for the earth. In a May Day open letter of 1871, Ruskin describes the contours of his own environmental paradise and the stark landscape of human choice. Quote, your power over the rain and river waters of the earth is infinite. You can bring rain where you will by planting wisely and tending carefully. Drought where you will by ravage of the woods and neglect of the soil. You might have the rivers of England as pure as the crystal, so full of fish that you might take them out with your hands instead of nets. Or you may do always as you have done now, turn every river of England into a common sewer so that you cannot so much as baptize an English baby but with filth unless you hold its face out of the rain and even that falls dirty. Less colorfully, Ruskin in a famous observation much quoted these days, but interestingly unmarked in Muir's much marked copy of the seven lamps of architecture. Quote, God has lent us the earth for our life. It is a great entail. Entail is a Middle English word, a legal term meaning to bestow as an inalienable possession. It is a great entail. It belongs as much to those who come after us as those whose names are already written in the book of creation as to us. 
and we have no right by anything we do or neglect to involve them in unnecessary penalties or deprive them of benefits which it was in our power to bequeath. I'm persuaded to wrap up these reflections, or at least to begin to wrap up these reflections with two rather tart observations. The first is from poet and echo critic, Wendell Berry. Quote, apparently with the rise of industry, we began to romanticize the wilderness, which is to say we began to institutionalize it within the concept of the scenic. Because of railroads and improved highways, the wilderness was no longer an arduous passage for the traveler, but something to be looked at grand or beautiful from the vantages of the roadside. We became viewers of views. And because we no longer traveled in the wilderness as a matter of course, we forgot that wilderness still circumscribed civilization and persisted in domesticity. We forgot indeed that the civilized and the domestic continued to depend upon wilderness, that is upon natural forces within the climate and within the soil that have never in any meaningful sense been controlled or conquered. Modern civilization has been built largely in this forgetfulness." End quote. The second is shorter from Patrick Vincent and his essay on Ruskin and Muir. Quote, Muir helped promote the idea of a wilderness, of wilderness as a pristine, safe place, separate and above civilization, offering visitors the illusion of escape while allowing them to ignore their own backyards." End quote. In 1893, Muir toured the Alps. It was an epiphany in more ways than one. While Muir had written many rhapsodic passages in his journals describing his experiences largely alone in the Sierras, it was in the Alps with their human Alpine interactions that he has one of his clearest revelations about the meaning of mountains. Quote, I hardly ever saw a grander, mount, grander mountain view than the one I enjoyed from this famous standpoint of Gurner Grant. I met and passed Hundreds in ascending and descending, many women were bravely going afoot, though the day was warm, and young girls and boys, a climb of 5,000 from Zermatt. A dozen or so sick or weak men and women were being carried up by four posters, as if this mountain top were a healing fountain or sacred shrine, where sins and diseases were sure to be washed away and healed. Certainly a hopeful sign of the time such love of mountains and beauty and wildness. The crowds of all kinds of tourists I have found everywhere in Switzerland shows a wonderful growth in love of nature." End quote. Whereas Ruskin had always factored human culture in his, into his estimate of Alpine landscape, Muir, at least early on, was critical of tourists and projected an image of himself as a solitary worshiper of nature. The Swiss experience, however, changed all that. Muir sees the hundreds of tourists and climbers on the slopes as medieval pilgrims journeying to sacred sites for enlightenment and healing. This would later serve to inform his concept not only of the wilderness of the Sierras, but of the creation of the national park system. This is a quintessentially American concept, America's gift to the world, some say, linked as we have noted to the westward expansion as a redemptive project. Americans traumatized by the cultural unraveling of the Civil War head west to a virgin land, that is minus the unsuitable natives as Muir once referred to the Mono Paiute who lived in Yosemite which would heal them and form the theater for the creation of a new human consciousness, the promise of California in Whitman's memorable phrase. In an 1895 speech to the Sierra Club, Muir praises the hundredfold increase in young men and women visiting the Yosemite backcountry, quote, with the sparkle and exhilaration of the mountains in their eyes, 
a fine, hopeful sign of the times, end quote. And in 1901, he generously welcomes the, quote, thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people who are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home. Much of this is subtly written against the alarmist views of Ruskin, whose sign of the times is not homecoming mountaineers, but as no doubt you are new, the storm cloud of the 19th century. Two 1884 lectures among the last that Ruskin delivered, which chronicle Ruskin's warning, the first of its kind, that something new and profoundly troubling was happening to weather patterns he had observed since 1871. Strange cloud formations and violent weather that he suspected had something to do with the calamitous effects of industrialization and industrial pollution on the atmosphere. A plague wind or plague cloud that was choking off the light, blanched sun, blighted grass, blinded man, he told his largely bewildered audience. These are two extraordinary drawings of the, the mechanism and movement of clouds that Ruskin published in Modern Painters 5. While Ruskin's carefully documented meteorological observations were widely dismissed at the time, crazy old Ruskin. By the early 20th century, scientists were connecting the dots and beginning to establish the relationship between industrial pollution and changes in the atmosphere. J.W. Graham, for example, in The Destruction of the Daylight, a study in the smoke problem from 1907, indicates that industrial statistics bear out Ruskin's date for the onset of meteorological changes and the so-called storm cloud, the mid 19th century rapid leap in coal consumption in Britain and Central Europe. The devil is every bit as black as Ruskin painted him, Graham writes. He is smoke, smoke mixed with damp. Emerson, Thoreau and Muir in different ways helped forge a uniquely American perspective on the natural world, a nature which had the power to redeem and refashion human life and possibility, but which as we have noted, was also inextricably linked to the myth of the American West and the clean slate it offered in the wake of the catastrophe of the Civil War. In the East, Thoreau writes, quote, fancy and imagination are affected with blight but westward lies the holy land where one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light, end quote. It was a vision built on the very American notion of leaving the past behind and relying on the benevolence of a land mistakenly thought to be without one. Ruskin saw nature through a very different set of eyes, through Turner, through art, through science, history, culture, and experience. Inevitably, for all the many correspondences and points of contact with his American counterparts, Ruskin's was a far more holistic, tempered, grounded, and complex vision. As Patrick Vincent observes, Thanks to his more optimistic vision of man and history, Muir believed it was sufficient to democratically invite his fellow citizens to visit nature as if at home in order to protect nature, a formula close to what we would today call light green or environmentalist thinking. Ruskin on the other hand would now qualify as a dark green or deep ecologist. Ruskin believed that a radical moral transformation was needed in order to redress the blighted human and natural environment. 
if Ruskin's reading of the Alps is much gloomier than that of John Muir. Our current ecological crisis, unfortunately, makes it the most pressure. Thank you. Sorry, I was mute, I was talking, but I was muted. What I was saying was that that was a, a really fabulous um, um, lecture, Gabriel, thank you very much. Let me just get this off my screen. Um, and the images that you used, I really enjoyed seeing as well. Some of those photos of Muir I had seen before, but a couple of them I hadn't. And it made me think when you talked about um, Emerson being unwilling to go camping in Yosemite with Muir that um, Teddy Roosevelt had no such reservations. <laughs> he actually did go camping um, with Muir um, in Yosemite. He was there for, um, for a visit with an entourage and Muir said, well, you know, can't you get away from the dinner you're supposed to go to and join me in the woods? And, and he did actually, I think for, at least one night, possibly two. So Emerson wasn't quite as spontaneous, I guess. <laughs> no, no. That doesn't surprise me. But um, anyway, uh, you know, Kay made it a remark in the chat while you were while you were speaking. She said that um, Nero's view of Ruskin strikes her as force, forcibly with the thought that the deepest connections to Ruskin are personal readings. Um, and I think that's a really good point to make. Um, you know, all three of the figures that we've been talking about in these lectures, Emerson, Throw, and Muir, um, responded to Ruskin, you know, from a very personal perspective. You know, they read Ruskin with regard to their own way of looking at the world and their own ideas about nature. Um, and when we read their response to Ruskin, I mean, as a Ruskin person, you know, I, I read their response to Ruskin and I think, oh, they didn't really understand, you know, what, what he meant. Um, and I think maybe that's part of it, but part of it is also that they had a different way of looking at things. They had, and they had a different agenda, a different way of seeing things. And so they were taking bits of Ruskin um, and interacting with him. There's a real interaction going on. It's not just, you know, reading Ruskin passively, it's reading Ruskin very actively um, and responding to him um, in a way that, that allows them to, to see differently, but also, um, you, you know, kind of to shape his ideas more along the lines of their own. And I find that interaction very interesting. Yeah. As I said in the talk, the, um, one of the significant things is a lot of the American enthusiasts for Ruskin really had not read much. They might've yeah. read one or two works, but they certainly, didn't, were, certainly weren't um, privy to this great trajectory in Ruskin. But, yeah. but that's not true for our, our, uh, our three guys. I mean, they really did read Ruskin, engage with him. Although it's true in a, a bit for Thoreau, because Thoreau died um, you know, early, you know, and I, and I wonder sometimes what Thoreau would have made of the later Ruskin, you know, if he had lived to read late Ruskin. Um, so it's kind of a shame we don't have his remarks on that. But the other two, yeah, they, they did. Uh, well, Emerson, yeah, Emerson also they lived long enough to read Ruskin's late work. So they did get that sense of the trajectory. But yeah, a lot of Americans who read Ruskin did not. I'm just gonna check the chat. So I'm wondering if anyone has any, you know, comments or questions that they'd like to ask of Gabriel um, or just responses to the talk yep, in general. Response. It looks like Jim's trying to say something okay. that he's muted. Can we, can we ask him to unmute? You, you'll need to unmute. We're almost there. <laughs> No. He keeps unmuting and then remuting. Yeah, he goes right back. Oh, there he goes. Jim, okay. 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 is that better? Don't, don't press no. anything. <laughs> oh, uh, all right. So, so my question, I don't know whether it's a question or an observation. My reading of Ruskin, particularly the modern painter's books, is that they're all sort of an ode to joy. What he wants to convince us of is that the universe is a wonderful, beneficent place that was created by a, a great and beneficent larger spirit. And that our task in this world is to, is to see that joy and embrace it and become part of it. Now, I know, as you said at the latter part of your talk, Gabriel, that the dark clouds and the storm cloud came into his work in the later years. But, but it seems to me that even then, Ruskin is always trying to convince us 
that the world is a place of joy, that human suffering is our own creation and human, human joy is our own creation. And I, I don't know how Emerson and Thoreau would have um, reacted to that particular notion. So any thoughts from your side, greatly appreciated. Yeah, I think that's, that's always true. I mean, even in that comment from 1871, when uh, the May Day letter, you know, that Ruskin is sort of appealing to this audience about this really could be different. This could be a joyous world and the rivers could be clean and you could be living a wonderful life and, and nature would be healed. So, so yeah, I think it's always in the context of a, of a profoundly positive, uh, you know, vision. But I do think my own reading of like the later volumes of, of modern painters, particularly four and five, there, there is, you know, there is the mountain gloom issue. And I think, uh, who was it? Maybe Rosenberg put it that in the early, in the early volumes of modern painters, Ruskin see, goes to the mountains and sees God. By, by modern painters four, he's also seeing deforestation and soil erosion and poverty. So, you know, I, you know, I, I think part of the, the things we've often talked about with Ruskin, the, the, the great thing in Ruskin is his concept of what it means to see. You know, and it's, again, he, he sees the beauty of nature and the harmony of nature, but, he, but then he also sees these elements that are destructive. Uh, and, and as he moves along in his life, that becomes more of a, I think, a focus for him. There's a question in the chat here um, from Andrew. Um, about wh whether we have a sense of how Ruskin's industrialist contemporaries responded to his environmentalist language. I think that's really about reception. Do you want to? Well, cer speak certainly to that? by the time certainly by the time we get to we get to uh, the storm cloud of the nineteenth century, it really is crazy old Ruskin. Yeah. Which, you know, the irony in that is that we now read Storm Cloud of the 19th century from such a different angle, especially in, you know, in the, in the present and the reality in which we're now living. Um, and we can see that, you know, yes, there's a lot in there that is, you know, rhetorical and mystical and, um, and very, it's very prophetic sounding. And yet there's, there's science in there too. You know, yeah, Russell right. was paying attention, you know, he was paying attention to what was actually happening. Um, it's not just some division of someone who's, who's going mad. No, exactly. It. Yeah. For 15 years, he's, meticulously doing these observations of actual meteorological change. And of course, as you all know, uh, many people now uh, uh, attach the, the label Anthropocene, the, mm -hmm. the, the age in which human culture now subsumes nature to 1871, just when Ruskin was making these observations about, about uh, meteorological changes clearly due to coal dust and uh, and massive industrialization. So, yeah, no, they, these were very precise, you know, uh, uh, data that he is uh, that he's putting out there. Other questions from the audience here, uh, Laura. Uh, you're still muted, Laura. There you go. Okay, yeah, we, we don't have the power to unmute ourselves, it appears. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, gosh, there is so much here. I'm so glad that this is going to be uh, back online uh, as a recording because I'm, I'm gonna have to think through a number of issues, but I, there's, there's one sort of, I assume this is kind of a quick question and, and then I have an, another sort of uh, uh, related point about question about uh, Thoreau and Ruskin, but the, um, Quick question is, I've, um, where is Humboldt in um, Ruskin's thinking? I've, I've never understood that, but I've never pursued that. In so many ways, the gloom, I mean, the, 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 the mountain theme in um, Humboldt is, you know, less pronounced. He had the scientific uh, uh, awareness of mountains and um, even a sociological curiosity about them, but it, but it's not the kind of emotive response in Ruskin. But on the other hand, Humboldt does have that that very charged uh, view of um, 
well, Thoreau does too, when Thoreau asks, are there not two powers in Nietzsche? And I'm wondering, I mean, there's all sorts of questions about that to me about why Ruskin sort of has a hostility towards uh, uh, Humboldt when one might think that he would find Humboldt um, intriguing. And perhaps a yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I know more about, you know, Humboldt in terms of Thoreau and Emerson, his influence there, but uh, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't appear to, um, you know, there's not even a great critique, as far as I know, in Ruskin of Humboldt. That's that's interesting. I just thought maybe I'd missed something. Some somebody on the chat, and I'm sorry, I don't, um, I don't want to go back and find out who it was. Also asked about Frederick Church, who was so inspired by um, Humboldt's writings and and goes to South America, and is in <laughs> some ways one of the closest painters we have to, uh, at least in that era, to Turner. And whether um, whether there's any um, connection between Ruskin's art artistic analyses, um, does he see Church's paintings or respond to them in any way, or is there any discussion of this uh, meticulous um, uh, kind of empirical study, but but yet with a with a religious uh, penumbra to a, a religious intent? Well, it's interesting. The only thing I know about that is, is uh, I remember reading once that William Stillman, who was an early, uh, Jim knows a great deal about Stillman. Uh, Stillman was a very early Ruskin, Ruskin fan, uh, mm. went with him to, 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 to the Alps, convinced that he was a great artist and Ruskin tried to disabuse him of that idea. <laughs> um, the, uh, mm. uh, but uh, Stillman, uh, says, I remember that this, this uh, passage where Stillman says that he first saw modern painters in Frederick Church's studio. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would have been like the, <laughs> the, early, the early volumes of modern painters in, in, the, in the, he first, you know, that Church was the one who in some of the, uh, where, where, you know, was, was, uh, was reading him and, and that was oh. the, the way that Stillman uh, began to, uh, to, to read Ruskin. What's really intriguing about that is I'll bet Church was, would have been reading them at the same time, uh, uh, Humboldt and, and Ruskin together. And maybe there's a little uh, sort of supercharged effect that, that I don't know if anyone's worked with, with Church on, in this, but yeah, I mean, you add the two together and maybe that's what it took to send Church to South America. South America, <laughs> right. Because right. there is, of course, there's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which of course that that was where uh, Muir was headed, ultimately. Well, but, right, <laughs> it was the cool place to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the other question, just I'll, I'll just say it quickly, and maybe we could also talk about this offline. I was really curious about um, the uh, interested in the quotation um, from Muir about the earth. It was not the earthquake nor the lightning, but the tenders. I think was snow flowers accumulating. Uh, which created the mountains. And so it, as opposed to the kind of, uh, well, it's a catastrophist, a catastrophist argument that would see them riven apart to create Yosemite versus the slow accumulation of the snowflakes into glaciers and a kind yeah, of natural right. process. Right. That, that has real powerful echoes with the way um, uh, Thoreau thinks of natural process, natural, uh, the earth is self-creating through slow gradualist process. It's, it's very Charles Lyellian. Um, and I'm wondering about that um, sense of, would, would well, Muir and Thoreau both have a sense of nature as self-creating through a kind of gradualist uh, uh, improvement or gradualist uh, coming into being growth, a dy dynamic process, but a, a, a growth um, and with Ruskin, I get much more of the uh, darker, sort of more catastrophist. Does does nature have that self-creating power in Ruskin? Does it does it create itself through small actions or? Yeah, Earth is a living organism. Um, it, it's, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, I I think in general, certainly. Ruskin would be less sanguine 
than mm -hmm. the Americans would be about the um, th that this that this is all just a wonderful process that will result yeah. in greater harmony. Yeah, right. Ruskin's, uh, Ruskin also is aware of aspects of nature that strike him as more chaotic. Yeah. Um, and so Ruskin's vision of nature, I think, is is a bit more complex, maybe a little less progressive, yeah. moving in one direction. I, I, yeah. I think you're right. It's it's it is it does feel prescient for today, and 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 in that sense, much much more resonant with us today. Uh, there's a darkness there, and a sense of of um, the fallenness of human nature that the transcendentalists try to put behind them. But yep, Ruskin yep. absolutely yep. understands <laughs> uh, the darkness that we bring. Right. I think, too, Ruskin's sense of the fallenness of human nature and its effect on wounding nature. Yeah. And so that they're, 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 they're together in this process. And, of course, yeah. Ruskin hopes that humanity and nature can be together, you know, in healing and, and, and redemption as well. But you never take that for granted, you know. Never it's not take it for granted. No, 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 no. And you have to fight for it if it's ever going to happen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's this very much been, Ruskin. Yeah, uh, this I is think, extraordinary. I think, Thank you. Uh, Ruskin's deepest belief is that nature has a has an incredibly deep and beneficent spirit in it, and you give it a moment, and it will try to correct itself. It'll try to make oh. itself purer. The the rivers will 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 purify themselves if you just. Mm. Get away from the pollution of them. The air will purify itself if you get away from the pollution. The problems are uh, of our making, not nature's making. Mm -hmm. And nature mm -hmm. finds itself with a with an unnatural thing or a harmful thing. It will try to get rid of it. It will try, like the body does when it tries to heal itself after an injury. Um, it will try to make itself better and make itself closer to the ideal sense of what it, what it should have been in the first place. Mm. Yeah. And I was, say a, process. I was going to say there's a question here from Stuart about how far are we with Ruskin from the theory of Gaia, the earth is a living organism. Um, you know, Ruskin does say that things are not, not either, you know, wholly dead or wholly alive. They are more or less alive. Um, and he has this whole concept of the earth veil, you know, and, and the idea that, you know, things are alive. In, in um, his lecture, The Work of Iron, you know, he talks about how, um, you know, um, material things have the breath, you know, of, of, of oxygen, it, it, because there's oxygen in the iron oxide that it is alive, you know, I right, mean, he, alive, right. yeah, there's this sense of everything being alive. So I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that he was, you know, an early um, advocate of Gaia or anything, he wouldn't, that's a, di it's a distinct theory, but the idea of Earth as a living organism, I think he certainly did subscribe to. Um, Jim, I wanted to ask you a question, because Andrew had mentioned uh, the response of industrialists to, you know, to Ruskin's appeal. Um, I know, uh, can you tell us a little bit about like Baker and that whole thing in, uh, in Butley? That was a, a success story, right? Have I got the neighbor? Okay, um, Sarah, do you know who I mean, the, the George Baker story? I know who you mean about George Baker. I was actually thinking of um, a paper I've recently been reading by Stuart Eagles, who's a Ruskinian, about another master of the guild, um, George Thompson, who was an industrialist uh -huh. and, and who ran his industry you know, along very Ruskinian lines, um, became a master of the guild. Um, but you know, the, the labor aspect of it was very Ruskinian, but also the attention to the environment. Um, and Stuart's going to publish on this very soon, so it's something to keep an That's eye great. out for. Yeah, um, but certainly, you know, those industrialists who were, you know, readers of Ruskin, admirers of Ruskin, certainly those who were involved in the guild, did try, um, you know, to use his to practice, you know, what Ruskin preached, um, to to incorporate his principles into their industry. But I think more more widely, I mean, my feeling is that Ruskin's ideas about the environment, which was not a word Ruskin used or would have been used at the time. Um, but Ruskin's ideas about um, what we now call the environment or ecology uh, were pretty much received in the way that those kind of ideas are received by industrialists today. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, th those who who agreed with his vision, you know, certainly tried to practice that. But in the main, I think he was largely seen as 
um, you know, someone, I, I, there was a reviewer who said that, you know, basically that he should stick to what he knew, which was art and, and leave, um, you know, labor and environment and all these other social concerns uh, aside. Um, other questions from the, from listeners? Or comment, doesn't have to be a question, can be just a comment or a insight as well, Don? I had a, um, yeah, Gabriel, thank you for that. It was fascinating. Um, I was just curious when, when Muir, Muir came to Pasadena and his mentor, um, Gene Carr, and, and he hung out with Charles Lummis. Um, do you know what, what the general sense of Ruskin was you know, in, in this area? Was it reinvented a little bit for Southern California? Um, you know, Muir writes a little bit about the San Gabriels and goes hiking up in there. I'm just curious what his experience might have been when he came here um, and, and, you know, stayed with um, Gene Carr just to talk about it, um, Ruskin and that kind of thing. This is just an impression, but it's my impression that um, Ruskin's influence in the early years of the 20th century, for example, in Southern California or in California in general, was both everywhere and more diffuse. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, I mean, everyone knew him. There were some people who read him deeply, um, but, you know, we, the whole arts and crafts movement, you know, is uh, influenced by Ruskin, but then there are a lot of other, uh, other elements in it. And it's always a little difficult to, to tell to what degree is, you know, is Ruskin really, Ruskinian ideas really driving the ship. Um, uh, William Morris certainly, uh, but also the, the people I mentioned, the, the uh, Muir's connection with the San Francisco Sweden, Swedenborgians that uh, the uh, uh, Devin Zuber in the Language of Things talks about, it's fascinating all these connections between Muir and William Keith and aspects of the California Impressionist movement and the uh, particular California forms of the arts and crafts, all those idealistic movements. So I think I, I always have the sense, and again, I could be wrong about it, but is that Ruskin's a kind of previous generation figure who has a broad a broad influence, but but there are other actors that are that are much more prominent in in influencing specific actions and architectures and so forth. That would be God, my response. Yeah, thank you. That's useful. And sometimes it's hard to, like you're saying, to disentangle. You know what's what aspects yeah. of Ruskin uh, are being adapted because so many of these people read Ruskin and then adapted him. You know, and read him in that personal way that that Kay was talking about. Um, and then responded to and adapted his ideas into their own um, vision and practice. So it can be hard to disentangle all that, but he's there often, um, even if even if they're not, you know, practicing Ruskin, you know, purely in the way that that he um, that he might have liked. There's an influence there. Um, other questions? I have one more comment that I'd like to make, sure. and that is that. You know, people who are listening to this are people who are serious about Ruskin and want to understand something about his influence on the world. Ruskin is tough going. And uh, I know from a lot of personal experience and many others of us who are scholars of Ruskin, I think of Laura and I think of you again, Sarah, who've been our prior lecturers in this series. Um, he's tough going and even people who read him didn't really get him because they didn't spend a lot of time really getting to what he was really trying to talk about. Um, I find that still after many years of doing Ruskin work that it's, all, it's extremely difficult to get people to really read him and then uh, absorb him and then come to some understanding of what he was really trying to accomplish. So I think we always must keep that in mind. So when we say that there's a Ruskin influence here and there's a Ruskin influence there, that is likely very much the case and true but the point I'm trying to make is, is that a lot of people who make those kinds of arguments or those kinds of issues don't really don't really have a deep grasp of Ruskin because he's so hard to get that deep grasp of into your own self. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
I mean, I tend to think that Ruskin is like the time has come to read, it's always been the time to read Ruskin, but especially now in the present moment um, and the challenges that we're facing. And when I do, I think I said this last time, when I bring him into my classes, um, I find that students respond to him better now than they did, you know, even maybe 10 years ago. Um, and they do find him hard going sometimes with, because they're not used to that style of writing, um, but he's so passionate and the issues are so familiar to them at this point um, that they make more of an effort and they, they do, they, it does resonate with them in a way that is often surprising. So it's, you know, I think it just, I think it's a matter, I think the point you make is, is, is well put, Jim. I think it's a matter of what we choose to ask people, to give people to read first. How do they first come to Ruskin? You know, what we recommend matters um, to kind of draw them in. Because my experience of Ruskin is once, once you're in, you want to keep going, <laughs> you want to keep reading. Um, one or two more comments or questions if, if people have them. All right, well, then I'm gonna turn um, the, uh, the mic as it is over to Kay Walter, um, Kali Guevara, just for a few minutes. She's gonna give you a preview of the next Ruskin Art Club event, which is coming up on June 3rd. And so she'll tell you a bit about that and then we'll, we'll close for the evening. So you can go ahead, Kay. Thank you, Sarah. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Kay Walter. I'm from Monticello, Arkansas which is pretty much the cultural middle of nowhere. I live a long way from Los Angeles, from the friendly faces at the Ruskin Art Club, Roy Croft or Brantwood. I'm a professor of English and my university is not the sort of place you would expect Ruskin studies to thrive, but they do. My students and I study Ruskin in every course I teach from freshman composition right through to Shakespeare. When my students and I think of Ruskin's most famous saying, there is no wealth but life, this year, that idea of life seems inextricably bound up with health. I challenged them to consider a healthy life as well in everything they read during the spring semester. And so I would like, you to, I would like to invite you to join us on June 3rd when three of my students and I will share with you the results of our considerations. One of my students is Ashley King, a senior, who sees these ideas most clearly at work when she reads a novel by Robert Louis Stevenson. Mental health and its costs underlie her readings. The second of my students, Katie Vermilia, is a sophomore. She's been reading Charles Lamb and posits his essays as acts of lucid daydreaming, a creative exploration of fantasies. My third student, Braden Taylor, is a recent graduate. He's been pursuing grant-funded research to apply the ideas of John Ruskin to current situations of the laboring class. He has comments to share with us about the applicability of Ruskin's thoughts to social conditions during our present pandemic. I believe you will find, as I do, that my young scholars provoke thought and inspire renewed hope. If you're intrigued, please join us on June 3rd. If you're still considering whether or not you'll take part, let me add that Zachary Bullock, once a student of our friend Jim Spates, will be the moderator for the evening. Ruskin nurtured his own students into mastery and championed their best efforts. The relationships among a teacher and his students was always valuable to him. Mentoring learners was an outlet for his natural affections. More information about this event is available at the Ruskin Art Club website, ruskinartclub.org. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Um, and I can say just to, to add to what Kay said that Kay students are really um, phenomenal. I know several of them. Um, and I think you'll wanna be there to hear what they have to say. and. Kay is a phenomenal teacher and her, the way that she introduces Ruskin into her, into her, um, her classes and she's brought so many students to read Ruskin um, that it, it really is remarkable. And I think you'll all enjoy this event very much. 
So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to Gabriel for a, a really fabulous lecture. I'm sure like, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, you'll probably be getting questions in the email from people who, who are still thinking about it, mulling it over later. And I know you'll be put, this will be up on the Ruskin Art Club website. Um, so we can all access it there by YouTube. And I don't know if it will be, will you be publishing this as well, Gabriel? You think? I'm not sure. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go a stage at a time. We'll get it posted. Okay. Website. All right. So for this, at this time, if you want to hear this again, um, you can go to the Ruskin Art Club website yep. and perhaps we'll have it in print at some point in the future. Um, but thank you all for attending tonight and thank you, um, you know, to the Ruskin Art Club for sponsoring this three lecture series, um, which has been a great opportunity to think about Ruskin in America and Ruskin's um, relation to some of the most important and prominent American thinkers. Um, so thank you very much. We hope to see you at future events. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you, you, Kay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>